uh, committee for inviting me to give this seminar. It's always an honor to be able to teach and spread the wealth of knowledge all over the world. Uh, let me see if I, if I have control over uh, the computer so I can share my screen. Yes, Doctor, you can share with the screen now. All right, good. All right, can, can, I, can you see my screen? Yeah, if you can open your mic, also your cam, it's, uh, it's available also. Okay, uh, let me try to open my camera. Da, 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 da. It's not allowing me to open the camera because the host stopped it. If the host can allow me to do that. Uh, Dr. Anas, check this one, please. Okay, now it's working, good. Okay, so uh, first of all, I have to apologize because I am wearing my scrubs. I, uh, I cover emergencies at uh, the university on Fridays and with this COVID-19, I have my N95 mask and I'm seeing emergencies on Fridays. Thankfully today was a slow day, so uh, I'm able to speak with you today. Uh, this lecture is uh, of a topic that is very dear to my heart, and it's uh, bars, complex rehabilitation using bars. And when I say bars, it's a generic term to describe essentially metal bars that are used for both fixed and removable prosthodontics. I want you to bear with me today because I'm trying to give you a sort of a synopsis of history of bars, how they developed, what we did in the past, and what we do today. And I, I think it's very important, especially at a specialty level or an advanced level, that you have an understanding of bars. And I'll, I'll talk to you why. Some of my slides are of cases that I treated back in 1998, 99, so almost 21, 22 years ago. Uh, so you'll see the quality of the, of the slides a little bit different. We didn't have digital cameras back then and uh, some of those slides were scanned, so it's not as good as my newer digital uh, photos and so on. All right, so let's start. Now, this is a situation here where the patient is completely edentulous with two implants in the mandible. And I like to start my talk on bars with this picture because this is sort of the bread and butter of prosthodontics. We see a lot of patients that are edentulous and need complete dentures. Now we know in 2002, the McGill consensus, uh, there was sort of an inflection or a turning point of how we uh, care for patients with dentures. And the recommendation of the McGill consensus in 2002 was that the lowest standards of care for dentures patient is that we should place two implants in the mandibular arch. And this is basically what we teach our students here in the US and it should be what we do all over the world. Whenever we can, we should try to place a minimum of two implants in the mandible such that the quality of life for the patient is improved. Overall health is improved and their uh, sort of happiness with their uh, complete dentures is improved. Now, obviously I understand that's not always possible. Implants are expensive and not everybody can afford it, especially in growing and developing countries. However, it's always to keep that in mind that we need those two implants. In this day and age, the way we'd restore this, we place two locator abutments, independent attachments, pick them up and let the patient go and he's happy and we're happy. Our years ago, back in early 2000s, even before, we didn't have the locator attachments. We had really two options of treating the patient that presents like this. One, we could uh, do an, a bar, to connect those two implants and then place a retentive element on top of this bar or have independent, independent attachments with which were the ball attachments. And the ball attachments had quite a few mechanical problems, a lot of wear and so on. So they weren't very ideal. Uh, they were not as good as the locators we use today, but it was an option and, and they were uh, some clinicians that swear by them, and there are some clinicians that did not like to use them at all. It was personal preference. 
But when we look at types of bars available, and if you look at evidence base and the literature, there isn't really sort of a classification for bars. There is not a, a good manuscript that you could pick about bars. So the, the classification that I have here is a personal classification just to make it easier for me to go through this lecture. There is a round bar, there's a Hader bar, there's a Dolder bar, there's an Andrews or Alabama bridge bar. And the Andrews bridge is a bar that, and the Andrews and the Alabama bridge is, is the same bar, but one is when you use it with teeth, it's called Andrews. And when you use it with dental implants, it's called Alabama implant bridge. And then finally, the milled bar, which is probably the more contemporary of the bunch today. Now, when you, when you decide to use a bar in your prosthetic rehabilitation, whether it's a, for a removable or a fixed restoration, there are several criteria that guide your selection. One is the space available. And perhaps this is probably the most important criteria is, do you have space to put a bar and a prosthesis on top of that bar without that prosthesis fracturing and being too thin? Other factors include the shape and curvature of the ridge, the type of defect to be restored, whether you need to connect dental implants or not, what kind of retention and the degree of retention you need, what kind of support and the degree of support that you have, and with the restoration or the bar you're gonna fabricate, can you achieve passive fit? Let's go through those bars one by one, talk about them in details, and uh, review some of the criteria about those bars. The first one and probably the simplest of those bars is called the round bar. And it's typically 1.8 millimeter in diameter. And it's commonly used to provide retention for overdentures. Now this bar is also the weakest bar because it's just a circle that's 1.8 millimeter in diameter and any load on it can result in bending and fracture. So you need some material that can withstand some forces. The 1.8 millimeter number is very important because it is the number that is sort of, that relates to the attachment or the retentive clip that you put on it. If it's not 1.8 exactly, you're not gonna be able to put a clip that fits precisely on it and you're not gonna have good retention. It's, this is really important today. Now, as I mentioned, and I started with talking to you, some of this is historical. We don't really do many bars uh, for removable dentures as much as we used to do, at least not the, not the round bars like I just showed you now. However, if you still need to do a round bar using the digital technologies that we have today, you could still do that. But you have to know the measurements and that's why it's important to memorize that 1.8 diameter when you fabricate this bar. Another bar is called the Hader bar. And the Hader bar is also commonly used in removable, bar, removable uh, complete dentures. And it was described back in the 60s. Um, and when it was described, it was very long. And you see on the picture here on the right, the across section or how does this Hader bar looks like. And the Hader bar, the diameter of that top portion is also 1.8 millimeters. So the Hader clip that you use for retention is the same clip that you use for both the round bar and the Hader bar. Uh, Helmut Hader was the one who described it and invented it. And he was a lab technician. He was not a dentist. In 1992, uh, this, the, his designs were modified to make it much, much shorter. So it went from 8.3 millimeter in length to being three millimeter in length or height. And this is very important because if you've ever done a complete denture, it's really hard to find space for an eight millimeter bar. And you want bars that are sort of much, much lower profile. And that's why the modification and what it was called Hader EDS. EDS stands for uh, essential dental systems for trivia if you want to know that. And the header bar was very, very common when I was doing my residency back in 1997, 1998, 1999. And the picture, the clinical picture on the right is a picture of multiple header uh, bars or one bar with three locations, if you look at my cursor, for a, a retentive clip, one in the front, one in the, two in the posterior region. And, <clears throat> 
one reason we the header bar has this cross-sectional area, which is a keyhole cross-sectional area, is to allow for rotation of the retentive element. So the clip that sits on top of the bar will have about 20 degree of rotation there. And the reason you want 20 degree of rotation is because it sits, the denture sits on a tissue and the tissue has soft tissue and the tissue has resiliency. And there is some movement. So when you bite, either in the posterior teeth or the front teeth, the denture is gonna move around the clip and the bar, essentially like a seesaw or a class one liver. And if you, if you don't allow for resiliency in the clip to compensate for resiliency in the tissues, your clip is gonna wear out much faster. And that's why the header clip and the round bar were used often back in the day. Now, just to show you with this clinical picture, Th this design is not ideal and is not very good because once you put a clip all the way in the front and two clips in the back, you sort of negate that resiliency that you can obtain from the clips because the, the two clips all the way in the back are gonna prevent the denture or counteract the denture rotation around the bar. And this will cause those attachments to wear more often than they should. Uh, I do want to note that this is my board case for the part four back, back in the day, and this is the patient I used for the examination. The header bar clips uh, has three different retention strengths, and I show a picture of four clips. So what, why do I do that? Why do I show? Uh, well, actually, I'm showing three, and the fourth was clipped. So the, the retentive uh, elements and you should know that the yellow, the yellow color here is the one that it provides standard retention. That's about 800 grams. The white is one with low retention, which is about 500 grams. And the red is with increased retention. That is uh, about a hundred, uh, a thousand grams, sorry. And I said there are actually four clips for the hater bars. The fourth clip is usually blue in color. And the reason there's a fourth clip and the reason this is important to know is that many times today you will see in your clinic patients that were treated 10, 15, 20 years ago that had a hater bar or a round bar. And they'll come to you and they all, all they need is a clip replacement. But you look at the bar and you see that it's worn away. And if you put a, a yellow or a, or a red or a white clip, it's not gonna fit, it's not gonna provide the retention that you need. And that's why the company manufactures blue uh, clips that are essentially sized smaller. They're made deliberate, delib delib sorry, they're made in purpose to fit on a worn bar. This way, in case somebody has a worn bar, they can still be functional. Now, many times in postgraduate clinics today, when we have a patient coming back with a bar design, uh, like the clinical pictures I showed you before, we would give them the option into, let's take this bar out, put in some locator attachments and change this to independent attachments rather than continue with a clip and a bar for as a retention mode. Another uh, bar design is the Dolder bar. And the Dolder bar was reported back, back in 1961, so very old, before dental implants were on the market. So most of those bars were actually uh, first used on natural teeth, and then they were implemented and adapted to implants. And it was used back then for overdentures to connect teeth together, and you'd have a bar connecting those teeth and you'd have a removable partial denture or a complete denture that sort of is retained by that bar. Now the dolder bar can be of two, of two types. There is the dolder bar, bar unit, which you see here on the picture on the left. And then the dolder bar, bar joint, which has a tear-shaped cross section, okay? And the difference between both is one allows for some degree of rotation and the other does not. So when you have a lot of tissue resiliency in your denture, you don't really want to use a dolder bar. You should prefer to use a joint. Now I say that, but the truth is you shouldn't be even thinking about dolder bar. I, I present this as a 
as a historic sort of review of what was available. We, I have not done a Dolder Bar in what, 20 years now. And even when I was a resident, it was old back then. So it, it really is not something I, I advise you to be doing, but it's something you should know just in case a case comes to your clinic with a Dolder Bar, you're able to diagnose, you're able to treat, you're able to uh, restore. So this is just a quick, quick exercise of different shape, cross-section shapes of bars. And typically I'd ask my residents, what is number one? They'll, they'll tell me it's a round bar. What is number two? It's a dolder joint. Number three is an eye bar. It's sort of a special case of the round bar or the hater clip. They're very similar. Number four is the dolder unit. Number five is the hater EDS. And number six is the hater as was discovered by hater initially with the long profile. Now, another type of bar that I mentioned is the Andrews bar when, you're, when used on natural teeth or the Alabama implant bridge. And this bar is not really uh, sort of well known. It's very, very specialized and very few people know about it, but it's an option that at least I used back when I was a resident. And the way this bar works, it, it comes as a series of curved friction bars. You see my cursor, I'm pointing to the bar right now. It's right here. And this, those friction bars are curved, so they're, they're part of a circle. And they come with different radii, so when you buy them, you have to pick the correct curvature for your patient. So you'd have a diagnostic cast, and you look at that curvature, and there's a template that you can overlay over the cast and say, okay, well, I need a quarter of an inch curvature and so on. So you select your, your curvature and with that comes a corresponding retentive rider that you see down here in the picture where I'm pointing with my cursor. This is the retentive metal rider, okay? That's incorporated with a superstructure of acrylic. And this has a friction fit on top of the uh, metal bar and the patient inserts it in. And it's, it's, it's almost as a fixed restoration. The retention is really, really high. The problem with this curved friction bar is that it's made of base metal. And whenever we try to cast it, and you see here there's a casting and it's resting on top of three implants. The casting is made with precious type three gold and type three gold does not chemically bind when you cast it to this metal because it's a base metal. And all of the retention there is mechanical. That's a problem because it's, it's just not very strong. So you have to make sure you make the connection or the connector area very thick as you see in this picture here. This is the same patient treatment, but this is the resin pattern that I did back in 1997 almost. Uh, it's not a very good option. And the truth is, I don't recommend anybody ever using this solution, but it's there in case you have, again, a patient that comes to your clinic with a strange bar, you know exactly what it is. Uh, problems with it, it's bulky. So you need a big space for it and it's weak. Uh, the connection here, if it's not very thick, it can break. And one problem I had often when my, with this patient that I treated, and I'll show you more because this patient I've done all kinds of dentistry on him, uh, is if the patient makes a mistake and eats without the superstructure sitting on top of this bar, the bar may bend and then your superstructure will not fit in, on it anymore. And that happened to me a couple times with this patient. He'd forget that he has a, a superstructure that should be seated on it and will eat something without it on it and it'll bend the bar and I had to redo the whole thing over. Um, and the last type of bar is the milled bar. And the milled bar is the most common contemporary solution that we use today. And can, you can use it both with removable and fixed, and I'll show examples in a little bit. Uh, and it depends on when do you use a prescribed metal bar. And the truth is, when I teach, I say, never. <laughs> With mil milled bar, it's typically a restoration you want to avoid as much as you can because it adds complexity to the treatment, it adds to the cost, it adds to the finances, less chances of you succeeding with this, with this treatment. However, there are some instances where sometimes it's the only thing you can do. 
And typically we use mild bars in, in cases that are compromised. And I'll show a few of those. And that the design and uh, the type of this mild bar, mild bar will depend on many factors, including number of implants present, the anti-procedure spread of implants, which arch are you planning on restoring, uh, what edential space, how big it is, what is the span, whether there is a big soft tissue defect or not, if the patient has parafunctional habit, and what type of occlusion you are planning on ending up with. And it's indicated that when you desire retrievability, uh, implants are not healthy, uh, you're not sure that they're healthy, you want to do a screw retained restoration, but the implants are uh, severely angled, when you have long span edentulous space that the biomechanics of doing a restoration is compromised. When you have extensive bone resorption, I mentioned that poor implant angulation and the poor prosthesis implant ratio. And the poor prosthesis implant ratio is a very subjective criteria. There is really no evidence today to say, well, if the implant is, is if the crown is, one and a half times or two times the length of the implant, you're gonna have a problem. There's no such thing, we don't know. But when you're trying to treat a patient, you have to always plan to give the patient the best biomechanically uh, sound restoration you could. And that includes improving your prosthesis to implant ratio. So let's look at some treatments. And this is one of, this is the same patient that I treated with that Alabama implant bridge. And as I mentioned, this was done 20 years ago. And that's why the low quality of the pan. This is a pan that I took a picture of and then developed a film, then made it into a slide, then took the slide and scanned it. And that's why it looks not very good. But what I want you to see is that this patient has uh, Alabama bridges on both sides, right and left. On the mandibular molar on the left side, there's a gold crown, a surveyed gold crown that I made and on the premolar, there's a surveyed uh, ceramo metal crown that I made, and I did a partial denture there. The patient was not happy with the lower partial denture. He wanted something fixed. He really had no bone whatsoever in that area to place implants. So he wanted implants, so we placed those very long implants. And when you look at it and say, what, what are you doing? You are placing implants in the inferior alveolar nerve. Well, not really, we, we did some nerve repositioning here so that we can place implants. And back in the day when I was a resident, we always put in the longest implant we could put in there. I believe those are 18 millimeter and 15 millimeter implants. So we would go, we, we would go to great lengths back then to place long implants. Not as much today, but we still try to improve biomechanics as much as we can. This is below here, two pictures is the resin uh, pattern for those two bars that, that I made and I casted. And this what the restoration looks like in the patient mouth, the metal framework. And then you just do a regular wax up of teeth and you process that in acrylic and you snap it on top of this bar. And I talked to you about the problems I had. And this is what it looks like on a cast and in patient mouth. And those are the superstructures that sit on top of the Alabama bars. So here on the right side, the three unit Alabama bridge, a two unit Alabama bridge, a gold crown, a ceramic metal crown. Now this patient, years passed, and I changed those Alabama bridges probably twice, and then patient basically lost all his mandibular teeth because of periodontal disease. And what we did is we placed two screw retain crowns on the implants on the left side in the mandible and attempted to place two implants anteriorly here, here to fabricate a fixed restoration on top. But those fixed restoration, those implants in the anterior re region failed. And I just wanna show you here, the crown to implant ratio in this patient is there's about 24 millimeter of prosthesis and then 18 millimeter of implants. Not a bad ratio, but with today's implant, if you're placing an eight, implant, eight millimeter implant here with a 24 millimeter uh, restoration, who knows what will happen. 
but this is the patient basically before with the, with the Alabama bridges and after placing the two anterior implants and we place two implants on the left side here. But as you could see, we're left with a, a mechanically uh, an unfavorable situation. If we're going to place a restoration on top of those implants, we're going to have a long span edentulous area in between the implants. The other thing that we're going to have is that, remember, I showed you how big of a, uh, an interocclusal space we have to fill in there. And in such instance, doing a substructure, superstructure might be a good idea. One, you reduce the amount of porcelain you need to, to bake on metal, because if you have a thick amount of metal uh, and you apply porcelain to it, it's going to be hard to match those coefficients of thermal expansion to make them cool uh, at the same rate and so on. So you wanna make sure you're, you're, uh, you have a rigid connection between those implants, but then the part that has porcelain on top of it is not very thick and that you can divide it into parts so that it is easier for your lab technician to, to apply porcelain. And so this is what we've done here. And I say milled bar. This is not the milled bar that you, you are used to today. This is not the CAD CAM uh, bar. This here was a resin pattern that we use castable abutment on. You see those castable uh, abutments here. And then we had a resin pa pattern and we used a hand mill essentially in the lab that with your hand you move it. It looks like a surveyor with a hand piece on it to mill this bar at a certain taper. And I believe the taper here was a six degree taper all around. And look at the intimate connection here. It's seated uh, intimately on the tissues, but not enough to, to produce pressure. And from there, we would cast this, this bar. And, and when you cast those bars, again, we did not use base metal to cast those bars. We would use a semi-precious metal, metal at a minimum. And they were very expensive back then. And in this day and age, if you're going to cast a bar like this from a semi-precious material, you're, you're going to pay a fortune for it. And this is the bar after casting. And you can see it fits very nicely on the cast, passively fitting. And you have to make sure it's passive. And that's why you never fabricate a bar like this before you verify your cast and make sure it's extremely accurate. And then you try it in the patient's mouth. And I want you to take a, a close look here to the top picture. Look how well fitting this bar is around the tissues. This is important because I'm gonna circle back to it again, but you don't see any blanching. So there's not a lot of pressure there, but also you don't see space. And it's cleaning, when you do a restoration like this, cleaning is really important. And cleaning is usually e easy here in the front area when, it, when it's edentulous. You could slip a super floss in there and, and clean. The problem comes where I'm pointing in between the implants on both sides. So you have to make sure the embrasures there allow for a bruxy brush when you design, when you have a design like this. You try this in patient mouth, it fits, and then you send this back to the lab, or if you wanna do it yourself, you can. And you cast a metal framework and you apply ceramic to it. And this is the wax up with uh, cut back for this superstructure. And we have lateral screws on the side. We have six here, and we decided to do this in two portions to make it easier for the ceramist to apply ceramic. When it's one big piece, it's harder. Now, uh, would I do the same today? Uh, most likely I would make it all one piece. The ceramics that we have now can do it easier with that. <coughs> and I would reduce the number of uh, lateral screws. You don't need that many uh, today. So you'd cast that, you'd apply your ceramic and you'd have, this is the restoration. This is the restoration in the, on the cast. And this is the restoration in the patient mouth. Now, I typically will show this to my students and pause for five minutes and say, do you see any issues here? And if you look carefully, yes, you'll see an issue. On the top bar picture here, the bar is fitting the tissues very nicely. And the bottom picture, look at this space that happened down here. And I had, I had uh, inserted this bar, the patient was extremely happy, went home, a week later, I get a call from the patient who says, 
I'm not able to speak very well. My speech is not good. So I say, what, what is what, what specifically in your speech? In your speech? And he tells me, well, I can't pronounce the S sounds. I say, okay, well, that's probably the relationship of the mandibular incisors to the maxillary incisors. I was pretty sure the vertical dimension is 100% because this is a patient I've been treating for years and we had vertical stops all through and we, we duplicated that. So I bring the patient in, I look at vertical dimension occlusion, I look at the closest speaking space, I look at the relationship of the mandibular incisors to the central incisor, everything looks good. And then I notice that there's a lot of air escaping from the bottom underneath the denture, which making it harder for the patient to speak. And I recorded him speaking a sentence that has a lot of S words in it. So I'm gonna play that sound now. Some shampoo samples to her sister in Mississippi. Sally sent some shampoo samples to her sister in Mississippi. So this was an audio recording, and if you did not know the patient, it's hard to say that the speech is impaired, but it was impaired, and I'll 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 make you hear a sound, I'll make you hear his voice when it's not impaired in a little bit. So to, di to diagnose the issue, I took some of this gingival uh, moulage material that we have, injected it in the space underneath this prosthesis, and asked the patient to speak again. And listen to this video. Sally sent some shampoo samples to her sister in Mississippi. Sally sent some shampoo samples to her sister in Mississippi. And if you could clearly tell that this is much, much clearer than the previous recording. So it was the problem. Well, what do you do at this stage? You know, you, you have metal that you spent a fortune on. You have ceramic uh, work that also you spent a fortune on. You spent weeks doing this stuff, if not months. How do you fix that? Well, we tried to do one thing to do what we call a party gum for this patient made of acrylic. So I, I made a custom tray here on the top corner, right corner, which we typically use for maxilla, in maxillofacial prosthodontics. It's essentially to take a facial impression of those teeth and made a, an impression with a vinyl polysiloxane, light and heavy body, and captured that space very well. And I took that space, waxed it up with wax. Well, I drew the area that I wanted to sort of uh, close and waxed it up and processed that in acrylic and this is the acrylic piece and i put it in the patient's mouth and i asked him to speak and his speech was perfect he went home he was happy but then a week later he called me hey doc i spent twenty thousand dollars on this prosthesis i don't know how much money he spent on it but it was a lot of money he says and at the end, what do I have to show for? You're giving me this plastic piece that I have to put in every time I speak. And it's really annoying me that I paid all this much money and I'm not getting a good restoration, essentially. So thankfully, we had this prosthesis made from uh, semi-precious metal. So welding metal to it is relatively easy. So we sent that prosthesis back to the lab and we applied, we welded metal to it. Uh, and that sealed the space and the patient was extremely happy. And I saw this patient two years ago, which was probably about 18, 19 years since I inserted this restoration and it's still in place working just as new. Um, one thing that I wanna also point you to, I wanna go back a little bit, oh, I'm going forward. To this view here. And it's something that it took me years of experience to even think about. Now, when you're working with maxillary dentures, especially, many times in the anterior area, we have tissues that are uh, mobile. So we have those techniques to make impressions such that you don't compress that soft tissue. And in the anterior region, here in this mandible and in, in many restorations, when you're working on a pontic site that has 
uh, essentially an, a long edential span. There's a lot of soft tissue there. When you make an impression, you have to be really careful about not compressing this tissue. Because if you compress it and you're going to make a bar on top of it or a pontic on top of it, your, your pontic is not going to fit because you registered the tissue in a compressed state. And the bar is going to, uh, and the lab is going to even compress it some more to make sure you have a good seal in that area. Uh, and it could go also the other way around. We many times make provisional restorations with ovate pontics. So if you make a provisional restoration with an ovate pontic that compresses the soft tissue, once you remove your provisional, the tissue is gonna rebound. And if you make an impression of that uh, on the tissues that rebound, when you go and you try your pontic, there are going to be a space between your pontic and your tissues. So it's very, very important to pay attention to that when you fabricate a restoration, especially when the pontic area is a long span area and the soft tissue is depressible or compressible. And this is not something we typically teach in fixed prosthodontics, it's something we typically teach in removable prosthodontics. So let's look at more examples where a bar was used for the treatment of patient. And this example here is an example where a bar was needed because of the poor angulation of implant. And I laugh at it all the time with my residents. You, you've seen those memes on Facebook and social medias that show, this is what I think I can do, this is what my students think they can do, and this is what I really can do. And usually what you think you can do is 100 times better than the final result. Your final result is nowhere close to what you thought you think you can do. And it's, the problem is the same with surgeons. The surgeons would look at this patient, ah, oh, not a problem. I'm gonna put in 10 millimeter of bone width in there, increase the height, and I'm gonna give you implants exactly where you want them to be. But the end result is nowhere near what they thought they were gonna give. So this patient was treated years ago, not a lot of bone, a knife edge ridge, as you could see here in the CBCT and clinically. Uh, they did block grafts, placed the implants, and waited for healing. And you could see here, this is a provisional restoration on top of the implants, a removable restoration. And it's not clear here, but you look here and look how far buckle those implants are. And look at the angulation of those implants. Well, those implants are not really easily restorable, even with a cemented restoration. Look at the vertical and horizontal defects that you have here. So not only it's an angulation problem here, but you have loss of bone and soft tissue that you cannot compensate for by just using an angled abutment. And this is here another case where um, a superstructure, substructure uh, might be indicated. So this is the superstructure, a substructure for this patient. And this is a lingual view and you could see the axis for those set screws that are horizontal. And this is the final restoration with pink ceramic in place. Here is another case where doing a bar might be a good idea. This is a periodontally involved uh, dentition. And when you extract those teeth, you're gonna lose tons of bone. And, you, and the relationship between the maxillary and mandibular ridge will become different. Look at how much bone loss occurred in the maxilla after extractions. So it's not only vertical, but also horizontal, it went back. The patient was in a class one almost, and now it's a class three. And that's a good place to use a bar because your biomechanics where you have an anterior cantilever here is compromised. So this is a superstructure. And this is the, uh, sorry, that was the substructure. And this is the superstructure that is fitting on it with metal and porcelain applied on top. And this is the final restoration. More cases. This is a patient that has uh, deciduous teeth. And when you extract deciduous teeth that are ankylosed, you're gonna lose tons of bone with the extraction. They lost the bone, but did not regenerate the bone. And they placed, and they placed the implants in there. 
Now, again, the same as before, poor implant angulation, tons of tissues that you need to restore. It's not as simple as let me put an angled abutment and put a restoration in there in an aesthetic situation. And this is the final design here. You see, this is a little bit more complex of a design where you have a, a restoration with a screw retained that goes through the middle, but then the rest sits on top of a superstructure with lateral screws. It's clearer on the top right picture. You see, this is the screw retained restoration. It's all one unit. And then lateral screws here and here, and then a bar that fits on top. And look at the aesthetics with good lab technician, with matching the, the soft tissue. You can achieve very, very nice aesthetic results with, with such modality of treatment. Uh, it would also help if the patient has a low smile line. <clears throat> I circle back and show some poor angulation, poor crown to implant ratio. And you see in this instance, it's in a very localized area. Those implants are pointing backwards. They're also, there's tons of tissue and bone loss here and sort of a, a big space here that you need to fill. This is another complex design where there is a semi-precision attachment here where I'm circling with my cursor and a bar that seats on top of that semi-precision attachment. And then there's those, this screw retained restoration in the front area and the posterior area is retained by lateral set screws. Again, those are not designs you, you want to plan for when you see the patients the first day. When you see the patient the first day, you want to plan for augmentation, regeneration, putting implants where you want them to be such that you use the minimum prosthetic sort of uh, workflow. Th those designs are designs you use when a surgeon give you a, a patient say, hey, here, this is what I have do what the best you can with it. And you speak with the patient and going through removing implants, more augmentation procedures is not a good idea. But it's not something you should strive for or try to do to start with. Another case where using such bars is, is helpful and, and, and good. And this is when you have those maxillofacial patients. This is a gunshot wound. A uh, patient was shot himself put the gun in his mouth and, and, and shot himself and essentially put a hole in his maxilla and mandible. We see this also with many cancer patients where you have this loss of soft tissue and hard tissue. And this using a metal bar to, for the bulk of restoration is a good idea in such instances. Now, more contemporary ways of doing uh, some of this work. And this is a case I, I took from uh, my friend, Dr. Baba, who was the president of the American College of Pros. But this is a patient that has implants in maxilla mandible. The uh, plan was to do an overdenture in the maxilla and a fixed restoration in the mandible. Both of them will need a metal bar. So you make your impression, conventional impressions, you pour the cast, you must verify the cast, and you have a wax up or a duplicate of the patient's existing restoration, and you scan both, or you send it to, to a lab and they would scan it. And this is what you see, uh, the scan cast, the scan provisional all overlaid on top of each other, and the design of the bar that you will have for the patient. And this particular bar, there's a substructure and a superstructure to it, the substructure uh, rigidly connects all the implants and would have CICA attachments on it. And the superstructure would be the one that you apply uh, acrylic and teeth, plastic teeth to. You try that in the mouth, make sure it's passively fitting, and then the rest is, is history. You just, uh, you just set the teeth and process that. The same process in the mandible, scanned master cast, a scanned uh, acrylic, uh, restoration or the provisional restoration or the uh, denture that the patient is wearing, the virtual design of the bar, and this is for a fixed restoration with the wraparound acrylic. And this is, you try it in the mouth, it's passively fit, fitting, the next steps are, are easy and conventional. And this is the, the both bars in the patient mouth with the sub superstructure shown in the maxilla left and right. Now, with those bars, most of the more contemporary materials, I showed you many that they were casted, and the last two that I showed were milled. 
And today we use titanium for that. And titanium is, you really, we really need to know exactly what titanium is. The atomic number for titanium is 22. The molecular weight is 47.87. Those things you need to memorize especially some of you are taking the board exams in PROS. This, this is sort of a bread and butter of what we do every day. Uh, it is in the fourth group in the periodic table. And titanium is the ninth most uh, abundant uh, metal on earth. Uh, so it's, it's, it's common, it's everywhere. And that's why it's cheap. And it has very, very nice properties. One trivia question is that titanium is the only metal that reacts with nitrogen. And this is sort of a fun fact, but it's an important fact because nitrogen is an inert gas and sometimes it's used to preserve uh, uh, metals. So they, they sometimes they'll, they'll have a, uh, a package that's, that has a metal in it with, with, with nitrogen gas around it. Uh, you can't do that with titanium because it would, would burn. Titanium also oxidizes it readily with oxygen. So there's almost always oxygen in titanium. And I say that because it's also important to know what are the titanium grades that we have. And again, this is a common question on the boards. And in dentistry, we typically use one of five grades of titanium. There are the commercially pure grades, uh, four grades, grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four. And the difference all those, the, the four grades, grade one, two, three, four, are made of com commercially pure titanium, which is basically 99% titanium, but there is some impurities in them. And that's the difference between grade one and grade four. As you go up, there's more oxygen. The more oxygen is with titanium, the more, the less ductile it is. Okay, and this is important to know. And you'll see that the strength increases at, as you go from grade one to grade five. Grade five is not commercially pure. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an alloy. So, and that's what's typically called the, the, tie, the titanium six aluminum for vanadium. And uh, that's what's used typically in Zimmer implants. Now there's newer formulations that are not necessarily graded yet, like the titanium that's mixed with zirconia and nobium or niobium. And uh, the latest implant from Straumann, the rock solid, has 83% to 87% titanium and 13 to 17% zirconium. So there are newer forms of titanium that are used in dentistry that beyond the grade one to five that I mentioned, they're not graded yet, but uh, in the future, they probably will be added as grades. Now, another thing to know is that there are many other grades that we don't use in dentistry. And there are commercially pure titanium that is beyond the grade one, two, three, four. There's commercially pure titanium that is nine, I believe, and there's an 11. So just make sure you understand that uh, when you speak about titanium. So I took a little bit of detour to speak about titanium, and then I will show sort of now a more contemporary way of how we do the bars, uh, at least how you do them with a metal, uh, ceramic metal restoration. And I show this patient also when I lecture about contemporary planning for implant placement. This is a patient that needed uh, essentially extracting of, extraction of all her teeth for periodontal disease. She has an implant on the maxillary left canine, and that implant is osteointegrated. There's no bone loss around it whatsoever, but all the other teeth are mobile, uh, periodontally involved, and so on. There's a little super eruption in the, ma in the mandibular teeth that uh, if we extract, it's not a problem, but the patient does not want to work on the mandibular arch because it's costly and wants to work on it in a, once finish the maxillary arch, then work on the mandibular arch. So in this instance, we can level the mandibular in plane down and work on the maxilla, complete that and come back and treat the mandible at a later time point. Uh, we scan those, we obtain digital impressions essentially. This is just a pan of the patient to show, what, to show what she has. And you could see the implant in the maxilla that we could still use, but all the other teeth, vertical bone defect, mobility, an abscess here, all kinds of problems. The mandible perimplantitis around these implants, forcation involvement everywhere, uh, and a lot of bone loss. Now, uh, one way to treat this is uh, with the all on X concept place four additional implant 
they'll become five with the implant that she already has. Extract remaining teeth, place implants, immediately load, and later come and apply restoration. Uh, it's not the topic of our conversation today, but I will show it be through because it'll, this treatment ends up with a metal bar. But basically because keeping teeth and using a surgical guide is a lot more accurate when you keep teeth in there. So they're supported by, by the, the surgical guide is supported by teeth. Uh, we sequenced this treatment so that we extract some teeth first, place the implants. Once the implants are in, we pick them up with the, immediately with the conversion prosthesis that we design, finalize that, come back, extract all the teeth and insert the prosthesis. This will help us preserve vertical dimension and will make adjusting of occlusion, adjusting of vertical dimension uh, easier. This is the comb beam CT for the patient. Fusion of the intraoral scan with the comb beam CT. Wax up for digital or virtual wax up for the areas we're going to place the implants. And then the design of the implants. And this is a little bit deceiving. Uh, the posterior implants are at a 45 degree angle as uh, described in the Olin Ford concept. And perhaps it'll, it's more clear here, you'll see more of the angulation of the posterior implants. The anterior implants are straight, posterior implants are angled at 45 degree. And remember, there's one implant on the left side that we could use. So this is the surgical guide and the surgical guide sits on the teeth that we're gonna keep initially. And then we complete a wax up also on top of the teeth that we are going to keep. And that's why the wax up looks a little bit funny because it's thicker in areas where there is teeth. And we would pick the implants, then modify that and adjust it later on. This is the finalized wax up. This is the finalized uh, STL of the, of the treatment. And this is the milled restoration. You see we added acrylic to it uh, lingually because you want thickness there so that the restoration does not break while we're waiting for implant healing. And we added also pink acrylic in the front just to make it look a little nicer. Day of surgery, we extract the teeth, place the surgical guide, place the implants, make sure there's enough stability in there, place our multi-unit cylinders that you see here and here and here and we kept those three teeth. We pick up those temporary cylinders that we, have, uh, we, uh, we inserted. We put rubber dam there so we don't burn the tissue with the monomer. We add the acrylic to our conversion prosthesis and pick those temporary cylinders up. We send that to the lab to be finished. Then I go and trim the crown on the existing implant and extract the remaining teeth fill in the pontic areas where I extracted the, the remaining teeth and insert the prosthesis. And I made a little vacuform to help me trim the mandibular arch to a leveled plane such that it's straight. And then adjust the bulky areas of the canines where we did our, our virtual wax up on top of teeth, make sure occlusion is good and let the patient go home that day. Now, three months afterwards, this is how it looks like. Uh, healing, healing very well. Implants are doing very good. Then you go and design your final prosthesis. And it is here a milled bar. You see the titanium bar and a superstructure that fits on top of it. And in this instance, we only needed just three lateral screws to, to sort of hold that restoration in place. And with that, I end up my, I end my talk and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Brof, for your amazing, well-informative lecture. We indeed learned from a lot of you and how to avoid and manage prosthodontic cases, especially by means of bars. Uh, please stop sharing your screen, so can I put the question of the day, if you don't mind? Done. <clears throat> Perfect. So um, again, as a reminder, as the number of attendees of scientific webinar activity presented by the Saudi Prosthodontic Society has increased dramatically in the past days, it has been decided to add an additional daily prices for those who wins the daily competition. In addition to a free membership, 
the winner will receive a voucher of 1,500 Saudi Riyal provided by Amasi Tamayas company. The award, the award uh, will be provided until April of 19th, 2020. Prof. Radi, you can now start answering the attendees' question on Q&A sections. And please, doctor, any question you are going to answer, please click on the answer live so the attendees can see it. The mic is yours. So first question is, is there long-term catastrophic failure or, comp or complication for ball attachments? So typically the problem with ball attachments hasn't been catastrophic failures. It has been uh, the balls themselves, either the retentive nylon clips or the balls will wear away quickly. Um, the second complication we'd have is that if, if we've done the denture in a thin area, the denture will crack there and, and break. But it, it wasn't catastrophic. It was more of the time you spent on maintaining those, those, uh, those restorations. They're just um, not as durable as a locator that you use today. Next question, how can I obtain that type of bar? Is it ready-made or custom? So the header bar, the round bar, and the dolder bar, you could buy uh, plastic patterns for them and you just cast that. They're, they're ready-made. And digitally, you just have to put in the specs for them uh, of the diameter, which is for the round and header is 1.8 millimeter for the dolder. The small dolder, I believe, is 2.2 millimeters and the large dolder is 3.3. Uh, so it depends which one you want. Next question. Uh, uh, I think it, it's the one I just answered, sorry. Uh, next question. When it is a must to do a bar and not a locator? Well, it, <laughs> I, 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 it's hard to answer that. Really, is it's a clinical judgment. There is no objective criteria. I will tell you that I will do a locator every time when I can because it doesn't take space, it works very well. Uh, the only time where a locator is not uh, advisable is when the, there is implant angulation beyond what the locator can correct for. So uh, typically it's a 20 degree for the standard locators, it's 40 for the extended range. And then there is the newer locators, um, cannot remember their name now, but the ones that, that can be used with angle can correct up to 60 degree angle. So it really is just the implant angle. If, if you have an angulation where you cannot correct for, that's when I would use a bar. Uh, next question, could we add locator to the milled bar? I saw that before, but I'm not sure about the indication. Absolutely, you can, and I've done it before. You put in a bar to correct the angulation of the implants that are severely angulated. Then on top of that, you put locators that are surveyed such that they are parallel to each other. It's a very good solution. The problem with it, the amount of space you need is much larger. So in addition to the bar, you need another three millimeter for the locator, two millimeter for the retentive part and one millimeter for sort of the bottom part of it. And then you need another one millimeter on top of that for the, the, the female part that sits on top of the locator. And you need four millimeter of acrylic all around that. So it's a matter of space. If you have a space for that, uh, then yes, it's, 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 it's doable. Uh, is in the Alabama case, why crowns were not considered? <clears throat> uh, the, the, the crowns on the left side would have been easily done and, uh, and not a bad idea. On the right side, you know, back in 1998, the crown to implant ratio was a big deal. And I showed you, the ratio there, we had a crown ratio of, what, 24, 25 millimeters. And that was the problem. If we're going back to do it, yeah, we could do, we do, we could do a bar and a fixed restoration. You could do crown, you could do whatever you want. It's not, it's not a bad option by any means. Uh, I was trying to show you this case from a historical perspective. So you'll, you'll see an option there in case it ever comes to you in the clinic and see it. Um, next question, I would like to know what would be the minimum height required for a milled bar? Is it recommended in patients with relatively limited interocclusal distance? Uh, that I would say the lowest dimension you need is about four millimeters for two reasons. One, four millimeters all around 
will give you enough strength such that it doesn't flex because you want something that does not flex. If it flexes, it's gonna break the substructure on top of it. The second thing is that when you think about your implants, you want your abutment to be about six millimeter height. So because typically there's a four millimeter screw and then two millimeter on top of it that you could put a composite and close the axis hole. And the four millimeter bar would fit nicely in there. So let's say the minimum is about four millimeter height. Uh, is it recommended in a patient with a relatively limited interocclusal distance? No, if there's no space, you cannot put it in there. Um, in your case of the last of the cast bar with the two piece prosthesis, can we go with hybrid fixed prosthesis? Absolutely, I don't like to call it hybrid, <clears throat> but yeah, you can. Uh, I do not personally, that's just a very personal preference of mine. Um, I do not like to uh, use acrylic as a permanent restoration. Uh, I just don't like to. Uh, and personally, in my private practice, I just don't do it. Uh, I realize it's a lot more expensive to do metal ceramic. And, and that's fine. Uh, I, I typically will talk to my patients and say, listen, um, you have those restorations that are available. I personally, not a believer of acrylic. Uh, you could go somewhere else and have it done. This is what I can do for you. And this is how much it costs. Um, it works for me because I work in academia. I see patients one day a week. So I'm not really uh, struggling to have my schedule filled. I'm very busy, so I can sort of be choosy. Uh, my residents will do a lot of uh, metal acrylic restorations. No problems with it. I, I'm just personal preference. I'm not a big fan. What about bone augmentation? Obviously, bone augmentation is a, is uh, is uh, is something you can always do. Um, it just you have to have the patient that is willing to go through the motions of having additional surgeries and so on. But as I mentioned to you, the bars is the last thing you should be doing. You should be always trying to do augmentation, augmentation, placing the implants where they should be. In many of those instances, augmentation either was not. Uh, considered because the patient was absolutely adamant they don't want it, or it was actually attempted and just did not work. What type of bar you will use mainly in your cases and why? Uh, I'll always, if I need to bar, again, I will try to avoid using a bar as much as I can. Whenever I can, I will not use a bar. But today I will always use a milled titanium bar if that's what needs to be done because titanium is very cheap. Uh, with the milled uh, technology, the fit is absolutely beautiful. And uh, it's, the, the physical characteristics for it is very good. There's not a lot of uh, complications that I see, mechanical complications with those bars, which is really nice. Next question, what do you think doctor with your experience? Did you face screw loosening with the lateral screws? I will tell you that I have done, I would say more than 50 cases with, with those lateral screws and I've never had a screw loosening, not a single time. Remember that the forces that sort of these, that, that those screws try to counteract are minimal. Our bars are typically six degree taper, so they provide very good resistance to lateral forces. The only time the lateral screw is uh, sort of put actively in, in load is when, you, when the prosthesis is, pulling, is being pulled completely vertically along the path of insertion. And that's, that only happens in the mouth when you're pulling on it down or when you're chewing gum or you have something sticky. And those forces are very small. They're not as big as the chewing forces when you bite. When you bite, the lateral screws, if everything is passive, are not really providing anything. It's your bar that's providing that support. Sorry, bro, for interruption. So can we take last two questions, please? Okay. Uh, next question, what is the complication with using bars? Uh, bars versus stud attachments, when it's better to use? Um, it depends on what bar, okay? The biggest complications with bars is that they don't leave much room for your prosthesis. And if you're putting a denture on top of that, typically you'll have a, a, a bar fracture. And many times we'd have to uh, use metal to, uh, to support 
to, to strengthen that. Uh, bars versus stud, I'll always use a locator over a bar, always, if I can. And the next question, and the last, if we use these segments of partial removable implant over dentures, no risk of swallowing or uh, suffocation can happen specifically for geriatric patients. Yes, of course, if, if you use what they call essentially the Nesbeth design, a, a unilateral partial, it's a risk. Uh, I, I, I have not ever done that. I only use the small segment that you saw with a fixed restoration. This does not fall or come out. So absolutely, it's a consideration. And with that, I thank you all. And I'm sorry I could not answer all the questions. Uh, it's okay, doctor. We are very thankful for your uh, valuable time in answering our attendees' question. By the end of this webinar, on behalf of the Saudi Prosthodontic Society, we would like to thank you all for your attendees and your time. We really hope to uh, enjoy Dr. Radi lectures uh, as gain as much information as you could from his session. Dr. Anas and myself are so glad we had the opportunity to host your session, doctor. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Uh, dear attendees, please stay home, stay safe, and stay tuned for our webinar session tomorrow with Dr. Adnan Ashgi at the same time, inshallah. Uh, see you then. Goodbye. Have a nice day.